I'd like to uh, call this meeting of the Board of Education. Flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> So we will uh, start as we always do with uh, public comment um, on uh, agenda items. Uh, again, the public, if you choose to speak on an item um, now, um, then you won't speak on it when it comes time for the vote. So you get a choice of doing one or the other. Uh, and, uh, and again, uh, you can't speak on the same item at the end of the meeting either. So you get one uh, bite at the apple on a particular issue. So, having said that, uh, any member of the public which to wish to come forward, and if so, state your name and address and address the board. Seeing none, thank you. Um, uh, the uh, item of uh, business today is appointment of the Advisory Committee on Operational Effectiveness. And the recommended motion is that the Board of Education hereby moves to an establish an advisory committee on operational effectiveness for BOE bylaws, Article 2, Section 4, Paragraph B, and approve the charge as described in the Commission Statement per Enclosure Number 1. Do I have a motion? Uh, Mrs. Gerber, do I have a second? Mrs. Maxson Canali. Um, so, um, uh, the, this was discussed at our last meeting, um, and um, I had outlined uh, the basic thoughts that I had, uh, and then by the end of the week, uh, emailed out first to the officers who made some suggestions, and then to the full board, um, and uh, the uh, proposed commission statement. Um, and so uh, time for discussion is now. Any comments that people wish to make? Should we start with the maker of the motion? Or? <coughs> no. Mrs. Maxson Canali. Um, first, I, I stand as sit as enthusiastic as I was before uh, for the idea of this committee. Um, I think it's vital that we get this feedback. I think it's vital that it's feedback uh, beyond just this board. Uh, there are so many perspectives out there that we would be lacking uh, without such a committee. And the decisions before us are of too momentous a nature not to. Um, so thus my second and thus my offering to speak. I do, however, um, want to open up one part of this for discussion. And I had uh, crafted a motion to amend uh, the commission's statement that's before us. And I do have copies here. But before I hand that out, I don't know if other board members would like to weigh in on the general commission statement before I hand this out. Um, we could have a uh, discussion on the general commission statement and any ideas that you might have for change. And then the conversation might either instruct your amendment okay. or not, your choice. All right, so then I'll go forward. And if, if everyone, if the feedback is unit, quite clearly negative, then that would be that direction. <laughs> uh, the language I was looking to uh, impact was that under membership, um, which, again, my reaction the last meeting, um, I don't take back one word of what I said. Um, and the idea of reaching out to the public, I stand um, as close to as I did back then. Um, but I will admit that I didn't consider carefully enough uh, the membership and how wieldy, unwieldy this could become. And so the amendment that I was uh, looking to offer was limiting the, mem the membership of the ad hoc committee, the voting members, uh, to members of uh, our elected officials who are elected for their areas, areas of expertise and for their, the people and the town members that they represent, and to address the public, and that would include the bargaining units, um, and not just limiting it to two, uh, student representatives, and the at-large uh, members to just members of the community, and to address them in a series of focus groups. 
Um, I have some ideas for how that could happen with the committee um, in terms of the organization of that, but the ultimate idea being uh, to re bring the membership down to a level of eight to ten members, allowing some latitude to the other town bodies in terms of how many members they would like to have represented on there, and then have that be the functioning more efficient group because what I'm already hearing is many members of the public expressing interest to me. I've heard of uh, members of the public expressing interest to members of the board. And my concern is, is that how do we privilege one over the other as a voting member? Uh, one board member last meeting referenced the notion of let's make sure we don't just have, and my phrase, not hers, you know, not just the usual suspects. How do we make sure that all groups get represented, all schools get represented? and and Again, I, I am unwavering in my support of the committee, but I don't think that's the idea of an efficiently run committee with the need to bring forward recommendations to three different deadlines. Um, and it's, I think it can be done, but it certainly is going to require a focus and a commitment. And that's what elected officials have been put in that position for. And so absolutely not closing the door to members of the community but also not privileging a few members of the community ahead of all others. Um, they are not elected to represent anything but, but no one. Um, and so I don't, I'm increasingly uncomfortable with saying this person, that person, that person, leaving out whole swaths of, of town members who have already started to express interest. Um, and so I believe we should be tapping into those members of the community through focus groups. Um, of course, they're all invited to come to the members that are um, you know, noted uh, under FOI, publicly noticed meetings. But so that's the gist of what um, I was looking to open up for conversation. Okay, just for a clarification, um, uh, you may recall that we created a um, advisory or ad hoc committee um, to establish educational goals and that state law requires that the community be uh, uh, represented on that committee. Um, but the practice of that committee, and I presume will be the practice of this committee, is that they're there with full voice, so they're not limited to, uh, quote, being a member of the public coming in for a focus group and three-minute comments here or four-minute comments there, uh, but their full voice at the committee meeting but it is actually the three Board of Education members who cast the vote. Uh, that was the process that was used in setting the educational goals. And clearly, clearly those three members listened to the total discussion uh, when they were casting their votes. But the actual votes um, uh, come from those three members, and the others are there with uh, voice. So just so that the Board understands that that, that was the process used before. Uh, but, but, but am I correct in understanding, though, that as it's worded here, these additional members are all voting members? And only those people on the committee are voting members. So that's the members of the town bodies as well as the select additional members. The only voting that's indicated on here is the election of the chair. No, and then the, the ad hoc committee is established per the bylaws. And so the committee follows the bylaws. And if and if there's a conflict between where one sentence is written versus the other one, it's the bylaws that control. So, so to be clear, the only voting members at all are the Board of Ed members? For this committee. Right. Okay, so Correct. I apologize for my misunderstanding on that. Um, it does not change my position on how I'd like to see this go forward, but thank you for the clarification. Mr. Asa. <clears throat> I would like to echo what Ms. Maxon Canelli said. Um, as I stated in the last meeting, um, in no way do I want to disenfranchise anyone in the community or any group, um, but I wholeheartedly agree with what's just been said in that I would like to keep this uh, actual committee focused to that around eight or ten members, which would be the three Board of Ed, um, one or two from Board of Finance, one from Board of Selectmen, and a few from the RTM. Um, and I think that number range gives you the latitude to do that. Um, I also agree with including the community through this type of setup um, because I believe it allows more people from the community to participate and voice, um, but it also won't necessarily 
uh, in my opinion, slow down the process. Um, so I agree, and I, I just want to uh, voice my support for this, and I think it's a, a good uh, kind of meeting in the middle of, of getting us off the ground and running. Other board members have comments. Mr. Patton. So I'm kind of in the middle between Ms. Max and Canelli and, and Mr. Asa in terms of structure. Um, I agree that the core committee should be eight people, but in terms of the, the, the town bodies, if you have two board of finance, one from each party on the RTM on a board of selectmen and three board of ed members, that's eight. So to go beyond eight core members kind of clips off the, you know, the bottom half of this in terms of members of the public and, and people at large and, and experts in the community, et cetera, which I think are kind of valuable to this. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like uh, I'm playing devil's advocate with myself here because I remember serving on uh, um, I don't know if it was an ad hoc committee, but a, a community committee led by a former Board of Ed member uh, to um, create a mission statement um, for this body. And there was between 15 and 20 people on this committee of various members of the community, including RTM, et cetera. And to get just one or two lines of text, you know, approved, because everybody had a say and voted and, and whatever, uh, and everybody did vote in that committee. Um, it was weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And I don't want to see that happen if, you know, <laughs> the committee's headed in a specific direction on a specific uh, problem to address, you know, uh, uh, consolidating resources for something and, you know, and then some people over here out of left field have a, you know, a dissenting opinion and everybody gets to vote. Um, it, you know, it shouldn't be political. It should be for the benefit of the town. So I guess my question to the body is what's the happy medium in terms of limiting the number on the committee, giving everybody a vote, yet not letting it become too expansive. Uh, again, I, uh, I have to emphasize, everybody has a voice when it comes to all of the discussion and the data that comes forth and everybody has a voice. Uh, ultimately, it is the three Board of Ed members that actually cast the vote <coughs> for that recommendation, just so that you understand the difference between voice and vote. But is that a so you've got two sides to the, to the voting aspect. There's the voting when you're talking about various issues inside the committee, and then there's a vote of the final results of that committee coming out of the committee coming to this board, which is usually where the three board of ed members would vote in an ad hoc committee. But internally, there's all sorts of discussion, and you do census of the body and that sort of thing. Uh, how the Again, committee and I'm the going. committee chair um, Understood. Uh, handled that kind of talk by consensus, but then come to an actual vote. I think that's up to the committee. Um, Can I just did you raise your hand? I, 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 I want to make sure everybody has a chance to speak. To something since he, since okay. uh, do you mind, Ms. Pitko? No. Uh, Mr. Asa. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Patton, I, just to be clear, I know you said you were kind of in the middle between Mrs. Max and Canelli and I. We're on the same page. So what I, just to be clear, I'm supporting what she's saying with the, with the 8 to 10. Um, and that extra two would give the latitude to, let's say, have four RTM members. Um, but that's what my thinking was. So I just, just wanted to be clear. I didn't want there to be confusion because you were saying you were in between us. I'm, it seemed like I'm one of you was going more towards no more than eight that either get to vote or have a real say. And then, and then you, but again, just to be clear, kind of just to be clear, I'm, I'm so supporting. So both of you want it to limit it to about eight or ten at the most. For yes, Jen nod. So okay, got it. Uh, Ms. Pico followed by Ms. Scarver. I, I share in the interest of that. I think fifteen people on this is is a lot, especially when they're open meetings and they're FOI requestable, and anyone who has anything they want to say, I'm sure, can come and and speak. Um, I want this to be productive. I want them to have adequate time to look at this. And looking at this, they already have a short time frame from January 15th. So I would support your amendment. Uh, Mrs. Grover. Um, well, I guess just uh, to the chair, I just want to clarify, because um, I know, I believe that you've started talking to some of the other town bodies. Yes, members. I have. 
Um, are they aware of the fact that they are not going to be voting members of this committee? Um, Just because I, I, I mean, I know. I didn't go into that level of detail when I, I sent them the commission statement, but no, I didn't go into that level of detail. Okay, because I mean, I draw this, drew the same conclusion that Mrs. Max and Canelli did that they would be voting members, so I just thought. Mm -hmm. it, might, it would probably be important just to share with them that they are, in fact, not going to be voting members of the committee and that only the three board members who are um, assigned by you will be voting members. Uh, other comments on Mrs. Maxson Canelli's uh, point of discussion, uh, Mr. Llewellyn? Uh, generally speaking, the recommendations that are put forth, are they binding or not binding on the administration? They're not binding their, rec their, their suggestions. suggestions or recommendations okay. to this board. It is this board that actually casts the final vote. Okay, and then it says here the uh, BOE chair shall appoint three members from the Board of Education. And then later on we talk about the committee will have eight to ten. Is that inclusive or exclusive? The way I'm reading this is it's inclusive. But you're amending it to be eight to ten, which is a thought we we're discussing. So does that mean it's really five? Uh, the maximum, Plus three? based on what you're seeing here, the maximum participation would be uh, tw 13 <coughs> if we filled every spot that is here, but uh, 12, I'm sorry, 12. 12. The way it reads now. Yeah, three plus one from the Board of Selectmen, okay, so one from the Board of Finance, two from the RTM, okay. uh, uh, then two from bargaining unit representatives, certified and non-certified um, so. So, so so I guess my comment here is since the board chair selects the three members who then select a chair for the committee and then the board chair gets to elect or appoint uh, folks to sit on the committee uh, I don't see there being a lot of diversity on this committee um, you know if, if you want to do it that way and get representation that's going to be slightly more diverse uh, you know, each board member could nominate somebody for the committee. I think there's too much power concentrated in, in, in your selection of individuals to sit uh, on the committee. Um, I think we're getting away from what I thought I heard at the last meeting, which was getting more community involvement. It sounds like we're kind of getting this back to that same old group of folks. Um, so, you know, I think 8 to 10 is... I get the concept of being unruly at, 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 at 12 to 15, but since it's, since the non-voting members anyway, and since the three board folks vote anyway, and what I thought I heard last time is it's going to be broken into different areas, staffing, finance, facility use, I mean, if you break it into each of these categories, that's too much. So a bigger group, I think, uh, all reporting back is, is, is actually probably better. Um, but I, I do think that we are, you know, taking away the power that we could get from uh, a more diverse set of individuals uh, from the public participating. Yeah, just for clarification, um, our bylaws uh, invest in the chair, the appointing authority to committees. But the way in which this has worked is I've asked the Board of Selectmen to, quote, recommend, effectively appoint somebody from their board, the same with Board of Finance, the same with RTM, the same with the bargaining units. It's not the chair of this board picking people from those bodies. It's accepting the recommendation that they have uh, made. I, I'm uh, not so sure this a, says it, that, but I yeah. hear what you're saying. So, that, so that, And then I added the, my original concept is I added the three at large, oh, I don't call it three, but the at large members so that if the collection of people that were suggested by the Board of Selectmen, Board of Finance, RTM, uh, was not representative, did not have a diverse viewpoint on it, uh, that we would then be able to get that viewpoint on it uh, by having at-large members. That was the concept. So, so cutting it back to 8 to 10 kind of eliminates that because by the time you've filled Board of Finance, uh, RTM, bargaining units, student rep, I'm not sure there's space left for anyone, but I, I get back to what I said before. If you want to get creative thoughts that are that are you know slightly different, I think we need to move away from uh, you know the elected officials at least for the input. I think we have to go to the professionals, frankly. Um, so I mean, each of the elected officials has their own profession, but I think we could bring a whole lot more to it. 
um, if, if we include the community uh, at, to a greater extent. Yeah, one of the things that might be helpful for Mrs. Maxson Canelli to clarify is um, will her m motion suggest that it's only elected officials, which would mean the bargaining unit representatives or the student representatives, uh, which was suggested at our la last meeting, would, would not be eligible. So Mrs. Maxson Canelli. Um, and I think in a minute I'll just pass, pass this out this way. We're all looking at what Mr. Asa and I have been looking at. Um, yes, the members of the committee are the elected town officials. That's what I'm proposing. But it's actually Mr. Llewellyn is, whether he realizes or not, supporting exactly the point I'm trying to make, which is they, we need to get professionals, you know, whether it's accountants, whether it's construction, whether it's builders, whether no matter what it is under all these categories, which we cannot possibly hope to fill with three at-large members. Um, and so I think the whole notion of let's not privilege one or two perspectives, but instead here's the efficient body that is going to be committing to these series of meetings and then having a series of focus groups where, I mean, I, I think of the, I can't remember actually if it was a town hall meeting that the board was having or if it was just public comment where we had a, a retired superintendent come and speak to the board. I believe that was the last, the spring town hall meeting. I mean, that's a perspective we never could have tapped into because we didn't know he was here. And yet, what an interesting perspective for all of us. And that's, it was in thinking of that and in thinking of the wealth of experience. And again, I couldn't agree more with uh, Mr. Llewellyn about the idea of, needing people who are more expert in fields than could possibly be. And so that rather than, as I, I keep using the phrase, privileging a very, very, very small handful, um, that we should instead say, okay, the efficient body that is attending all of our meetings, you know, to make these recommendations, be down to the elected officials who know to whom they are accountable, which is the town, and that they will organize a system of focus groups. Obviously, then there's the whole publicity fact, um, you know, aspect, et cetera, exactly to Mr. Llewellyn's point, which is to open the door so that we are getting any perspective that is willing to step forward. So with that, um, Mr. Dreyer, if it's okay with you, if, if I could hand the language out just so that everyone's looking uh, at what I'm looking at. Before the amendment gets uh, handed out and put on the floor, is there anybody else that wants to make a comment before that happens? Mr. Asim. I, I just want to echo what you said, Mr. Chairman, that um, I think, unlike Mr. Llewellyn, I was under the impression of what you said, where you will be going to the different town body leadership and asking them to put forth members. Yes. And hopefully by doing that, we avoid that proverbial old group of people. And, and hopefully that, the, that leadership from both sides, both Democratic and Republicans, put forth people for the committee that can do exactly what Ms. Max and Canelli just said. Um, at the moment, um, I've heard back from everybody except for the Republican caucus of the RTM, but the other bodies have, knowing that we want to get this going as quickly as possible, have gotten me names. Mrs. Max and Canelli. Whoop. I didn't see you raise your hand when I asked if anybody else wanted to speak. I asked on this side. Okay. So, uh, Mrs. Mac, uh, why don't you ha get it handed out, and while it's being put around, Mrs. Lou McCormick. Um, I just want to clarify what's being proposed, because it sounds as if, while we're saying that we want to have more diversity um, on per for per wait, wait, wait. You want to clarify what Mrs. Max and Canelli is proposing? Right. Both and she and let's Mr. Let's let her get back yeah. to the table, and okay. then... Because if you ask for clarification and she doesn't hear you asking. <laughs> so now, would you like to put it on as an official motion and then we can talk about it? Oh, I'm, I'm fine with listening to Ms. Okay, Lumicombe so first. why don't you uh, ask for your clarification? Okay. So we were just, I think, it sounded like you were all agreeing that we wanted increased diversity and perspective and professional input from different community members. Um, but I guess what, what concerns me from this, just this peripheral look is that it sounds like we're limiting ourselves again to public officials. Um, or it seems like limited to political parties. And I guess by keep continuing to go through Republican and Democrat, we are missing like a third of our population which is not affiliated to either. Um, and uh, I 
and I'd say that a good chunk of Republicans and Democrats are probably inactive as well. <coughs> and perhaps they could be the best professionals, and I don't know that we don't know that that's the case. Um, and we don't know that just because they're not political doesn't mean that they are not huge education advocates. So I continue to struggle with the idea of continuing to tie politics to education. Um, other states don't do it this way. We continue to go back and insist that our elected officials are, are bi-party. Everything has to be bi-party. I think that in this particular instance, we let party go. We don't need political parties or the mention thereof of any of those officials. We want individuals from this town who are interested, who are dedicated to education, who are, who are interested in operational efficiencies, um, who either professionally or personally. I think that if we continue to tie politics to education, we walk down a very, I, I would say, just not as honest and true a road as we could, because we're limiting the scope of the information and how we're looking at the information. And it may not necessarily work that way, but I can't see it as being as honest a set of information as it would be if we opened it completely and eliminate the whole political conversation around selecting individuals for an educational and also kind of um, operational efficiency um, discussion. So back to Mrs. Maxson Kennelly, do you wish to put the amendment in front of the body? Um, may I specifically respond to that comment, and then I will put the motion forward. Um, to Ms. Lou McCormick's point, first of all, there is absolutely no mention of party in this motion. These are, the pol these are the elected town officials to represent the town who are going to be the ones making the financial decisions and the priority decisions. So that is who they are. That's what they have stepped forward to volunteer to do. But you talk about Democrats and Republicans, I'll throw out there, we've got unaffiliated. We have Green Party. We have the Independent Party. We have the Working Families Party. We have students, pre-K through 12, perhaps each needs a representative. We have 17 schools. We have seniors. We have six bargaining units. We have a wealth of professions. That is exactly my point in putting forward this motion, which is we cannot possibly represent all of them. Therefore, why should we privilege three at large members from all of those potential constituencies that if we have the efficient group of elected town officials who will be impacting these budget decisions for this town and for the children that we are fighting for that I'm looking to restrict that that would be the ad hoc committee that would then be opening its doors through a series of focus groups to every group you just named and I just named, and that is regardless with no regard for political party. It's town of Fairfield giving ideas to help the town of Fairfield manage the coming situation. And that right now between the motion as originally made and this amendment, you have a choice. And it's either create a more efficient functioning group of eight to ten members who will actively seek out input from all members of the community, or you have a larger group of, commi of hopefully committed people who to make all of the meetings, all of whom scheduled, you have to try to sync whoever is doing that, and that you will be selecting. Well, is it the teacher's union? Is it the administrator's union? Both could undoubtedly be interested. We have the custodians, the secretaries, the paras, the, uh, what's the sixth one I'm leaving out? The, spe the special ed trainers. We have all of those bargaining units and all of the groups that I mentioned. So they're still fighting it out to be a, mem a recognized member of this ad hoc committee. And my suggestion is, is that rather do that, rather than privileging a few at the expense of many, create with my amendment the one functioning efficient body which will then actively seek out absolutely every group that you have named and I have named. And as it stands right now between the current commission statement and this amendment, it is an either or proposition of either both of them involve the elected town officials. Those are the logical people to bring in on this because otherwise, I'll just leave it at that. These are the two, this is the original motion and the amendment that have been brought, that are about to be brought forward. So 
To that, Mr. Dwyer, I would like to make the motion. However, I did have a question, um, and I apologize since obviously I already made a mistake regarding ad hoc committees and who votes for them. The first two motions that were on here are in fact the two terms interchangeable. Um, if you look up at the top where it says, so the motion is to amend, but I actually have three amendments. The first two are a wording thing that I did completely, it completely slipped my mind to check with you about, that the wording goes from ad hoc to then advisory committee, and I was not sure if the two were interchangeable. Um, we have used them interchangeably. Um, ad hoc comes from the Latin, which means um, <laughs> special purpose or single purpose only committee. So frequently ad hoc committee is, is the more common term used. Uh, because there's a time limited. Once they give their report, they're done. Right. Um, so ad hoc is the more common use, but this Board of Ed has used both. Okay, so then I would, where it says under process change and below that under time frame, time frame change, I just wanted to put it in writing rather than just say it on the board. Uh, striking both of those then if those are in fact interchangeable. So it's going straight to uh, the motion being that on the paper here it says under membership strike from the second sentence beginning with the board of ed board chair to the end of the third sentence which ends with 15 members and then um, the language below that which I will read only um, for those who don't have the copy of the text in front of them the substitute language would be the board of education board chair will also recruit members from various town boards including board of selectmen board of finance and representative town meeting the ad hoc committee will recruit community feedback in the form of focus groups from the school bargaining unit representatives, student representatives, and members of the general community. The committee will have, and I did make a mistake there with the math, I'm mortified to say, so uh, Mr. Asa has asked me to correct it too. The committee will have eight to 10 members. The size and number of the focus groups will be determined by the ad hoc committee. You make that as a motion? I'm making that as a motion. I have a second. Mr. Asa, um, you have spoken. spoken, but you're welcome to uh, make any final comments before the board discusses the amendment. If, if I may have the prerogative for it not to be final, I'll just let the board take it from here. Um, uh, so um, I will not be supporting this amendment. Um, um, Every committee that is ever created eventually disenfranchises somebody because you can't have 150 people on a committee. So I don't think that's a, a quite frankly, a valid argument. The, the choices do have to be made to say, is this a diverse representative, uh, contrarian views, uh, and whatnot. Um, and so, uh, so that, that, I think, argument is not uh, germane to this. Um, there are some people in this community who think this committee's purpose is to solve next year's budget problem or the following year's budget problem. That is the least important function of this committee. I think this committee is being, in my personal opinion, is being put in place to operate through next June to come up with ideas that may according to the term that some people have used, create structural change that may take two, three, four, five years to implement if you're going to create real lasting change that in combination uh, ensures the quality of our education but does it in a more effective or efficient manner. Um, and so uh, my focus is not on we got to get this committee going with a small number of people and get their report in by January so that we can make some budget decisions. Uh, to the extent that there is, there is no more low-hanging fruit in this district. That low-hanging fruit has been grabbed over the last seven years as we have constructed, constricted this budget. Uh, but nonetheless, there may be some ideas that could be surfaced in the fall and brought forward in January that the board could debate and that the Board of Finance and the Board of Selectmen and the RTM could debate and make part of next year's budget process. But that's, I don't think, the uh, real purpose of this committee. I think the real purpose of this committee is to implement the um, district priority for excellence, which our superintendent put out, saying 
uh, how do we engage in structural change for the long-term good? Um, I especially, um, I reacted at the Board of Finance when a member there brought this comment up, but I especially object to the idea of not giving our staff, somebody from the certified staff, somebody from the non-certified staff, a meaningful role on the committee. Uh, these are the people, 1,400 staff people, who will have to implement these suggestions. And too often, uh, ideas are made at this table, and they're not made with an eye on, will this actually work? Um, and at the Board of Finance meeting, somebody said, well, they're just self-interested union members. I took real exception to that. Uh, all of us who have participated in negotiating sessions um, all have come to realize, yes, they uh, advocate for their membership, but at the end of the day, uh, we reach agreement in the best interests of the students. Um, I know that the FEA has put suggestions in front of our superintendent as to how to make this school district more effective and more efficient. Um, I, I personally think that staff need to be at the table and not just in a focus group and, you know, um, and their discussion gets lost, but they're, they're able to participate in the real debate on various issues uh, with a voice um, so that the uh, final decision is informed by that. Um, state law does require, when you're setting educational goals for a district, that a broad-based community-based committee is put in place. Um, our bylaws don't require it for this kind of discussion, <coughs> but this committee is likely to debate some of the hottest, most difficult, most divisive issues that face a Board of Ed when we're uh, talking about things. I, don't, I think that if you don't have enough people who had real voice at the committee level uh, participating, uh, I think you're going to have a harder time, I'll say, in selling it to the whole community. So for those reasons, um, although the, it would appear as though, uh, uh, we haven't heard from everybody, but it would appear as though there might be sufficient votes to go down in this direction, but it won't be with my vote. Let me uh, go to other committee members <laughs> to make sure they've had a chance to talk. Mr. McPatton. As written, I don't think I can support this, although I do agree with some of the intent. Um, I think uh, in the exchange text under membership um, discussing how uh, the ad hoc committee will recruit community feedback in the form of focus groups limits the, it limits the chair of that committee on how they want to lead that committee and it kind of puts parameters onto the committee uh, of how it's going to do its research. This is saying that it's going to do its research by focus groups, and that may or may not be the best way to go. I'm not saying that that's not a good way to do things. I'm not saying that there shouldn't be um, smaller focus groups with experts brought in. I think that's actually a very good idea. But I don't think it should be in the actual charge. I think that should be up to the, the Board of Ed members uh, or the committee chair. Um, so. Um, I am in favor of limiting the number to less than 15, however. Um, I, I think if we say whatever it is, if we say it's a maximum of 10, if we say it's a maximum of 12, um, I definitely think it should have a limit um, in that membership section of, you know, community will have a maximum of no more than X members, whether it's 12 or 10 or whatever it is. Um, while 12 is a little more than I would want, I, I think to hit all the buttons, including if you want representatives from the bargaining unit, um, I think uh, that's, you know, that's the number you kind of have to hit. Um, I think having, you know, one or two representatives from the bargaining units is helpful. Um, having a Greg Hatzis or a Dave Ebling or whoever um, at the table, somebody who knows the, uh, the schools or the larger schools or the community at large, how those buildings work, where one building does something and another building might not do something, um, that they might, you know, uh, have some internal information 
and so, as opposed to just kind of bringing them in for a focus group or, or for a specific meeting to say, hey, we're going to discuss um, energy efficiencies tonight. Can you come? Um, I think having someone from the bargaining unit to do that who's already in those buildings is helpful. Um, I think the big wild card is the three community members. Um, so if you've got your two RTM, one board of finance, one board of selectmen, uh, three board of ed members, two bargaining unit members, um, and to get your 12 is, is the three community members, you either limit it to, I mean, it sounds silly to say one member of the community because that's really um, like who are you going to pick for the one member of the community. Three is limiting, but it's not as limiting. Um, so uh, again, while I'd like to see a person limit, I think as is this amendment, um, I don't think I can support it. Um, by the way, uh, to Ms. Max and Canelli, um, I actually think that we should change the uh, ad hoc slash advisory committee references to one specific thing, probably just put them all as ad hoc committee because I don't necessarily believe, even though we use them interchangeably, that they aren't always the same thing. Yeah. So just um, my two cents. Let me go to you, but first, is there any board member who has not spoken who would like to speak, Mrs. Gerber, Ms. Carnell, and then I'll go to Mrs. Maxson Canelli. Um, well, I guess I'm, I'm kind of torn about this because on the one hand, I'm at our last board meeting, there wasn't any discussion about reducing the size. In fact, if anything, I believe we added on to this committee throughout the course of the discussion. Um, and I'm always sensitive to members of the public being aware in advance that something like this is coming forward. Um, that said, now knowing that the only members of the committee who are going to be voting members are Board of Ed members, kind of changes my view a little bit um, because I, I do believe that at least some of the people who have stepped forward and expressed interest do believe they're going to be voting members. Um, so I think that that should be clarified because it may in fact change the interest um, from some parties. Um, so I'm, I'm really not sure to be honest with you and, and I do think having been on different size committees, I know the bigger the committee is the more difficult it is. Um, and of course, there is no way to get representation of our entire town from three or even five uh, members of the public. Um, so I'm not really sure which way I'm headed, but I just wanted to share kind of where and, it was. Um, and again, just to clarify before I go to Ms. Carnell, um, using the goals uh, committee uh, by example, the committee did work by consensus. Uh, and then through consensus and decisions are made, it was the three board members who actually voted. Uh, but there was meaningful, I'll say, engagement with all the committee members because they tried to work as best they could by consensus. Well, just, just to, uh, because I did bring up at the last meeting the ESSU, the Elementary School Space Utilization Committee. Um, now that was formed by the first selectman, which it was yep. not formed by the board. However, every single member of that committee did have a vote. It wasn't just a voice at the table, it was a vote at the table. Mm -hmm. And so again, I would just stress that I think it's important that everyone understands who actually is going to be able to cast votes at this because I, I think there is a difference. Absolutely. Ms. Carnell. I guess one of the questions starting with um, how to this whole issue of who will be voting and only the three board members and yet other people in the town bodies have been asked. Um, can it be open to the other town bodies to vote as well? I guess is my question and not just keep it to the three board members. That's the first, yes, I just yeah, want to put this put board could make that as a requirement. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, and then the second thing is, um, you know, we're voted in by the, the, um, the public in the town and I don't understand why those people wouldn't be represented on this as well as I know it was brought up last time in addition to having some students. They're the ones that are kind of in the thick of things day by day. So, you know, I just think it should be opened up to more people. Will it give more headaches? Absolutely. Um, but this way you, you get a better um, voice from the people. Putting together ad hoc, if, if I understand this correctly, putting together ad hoc committees um, will be done by each person, so there may not be any synergy unless I misunderstood. But the focus groups will be done the way each each person wants to do them. I wasn't clear are they going to be uniform. It was vague. My guess is in, uh, uh, Mrs. Maxson Canelli can probably say what she is assuming is going to happen, but most committees they'll have discussion and say, okay, 
how do we uh, engage the community and shall we have a focus group here, shall we have a forum here, you know, and so I think my guess is they'll debate those kind of things and then settle on the exact format. But that'll be, I would think, the committee's role to do. Uh, Mrs. Maxson Canelli, do you want to? Um, sure. I, and whether we to, change to, this. To Ms. Carnell's. So to Ms. Carnell's point, I think you've described it very well. I, I, that point on here I left d deliberately vague because we don't know who the Board of Ed members are and, and there are other town bodies involved who have also had various types of town halls and town f and forums and focus groups. So I think the group could give input, how can we make this workable? Um, how can we make this efficient? How can we make this outreach to all parts of the town, et cetera? So I left that you know, in the form of focus groups and didn't define it further only to give latitude um, so that the committee itself can figure out how to make that work. Um, and I could have just left it as that the members will be from these town bodies and will be eight to ten members and end my amendment. I've specifically put in that reference to the focus groups and the fact that the size and number of the focus groups will be determined by the committee because that is my explicit nod to the fact that the community input on this is vital. Um, my point simply is, is that where do you stop? You know, and that's where, you know, a little bit of satire here with my list of, you know, do you reach out to the unaffiliated Green Party, Independent Party, working for, you know, et cetera, because I think they all have a vested interest in this. And so, again, where do you stop and yet still have a functioning, efficient body? So, Can I interrupt you for a moment? Sure. Because you're going beyond and, uh, uh, answering Ms. Carnell's question and she had the floor. <laughs> Okay. So, did you have other issues that you wanted to bring up? No, that, that was really it. Okay. Um, my concern is, though, as these ad hoc committees are formed, that the same message is put out to everybody. That's what I was trying to say. And leaving it vague, I understand that. I think, um, Mr. Chairman, you know, how can we maybe change it or reach out to the other town bodies, the ones you've spoken with, and ask them if at this point they thought they would be voting um, in this committee? Um, typically at the first meeting there would be an orientation meeting where those level of details would be discussed and, and presented but if this board wants to say no whoever's on the committee should have a vote then we should amend the motion accordingly and then it doesn't have to be clarified. Uh, let me uh, I, uh, so a couple of Max points. And Canelli, you were wrapping up. Yes and, and I'll make this Mrs. quick. Llewellyn and then Mrs. Lou McCormick. And if that was the feeling of the board, it would be very easy on the first line of my amendment or, of course, on the commission statement itself to say the Board of Ed board chair will also recruit voting members. That could be a very quick edit if we wanted that. Um, I do, however, completely agree with uh, Mr. Dwyer's characterization of how this committee would operate, and that's from the point of view. I cannot imagine any three board members, candidate or currently sitting board members, who would ever go into something like this hear feedback and decide we're not doing, we're not bringing that recommendation forward and going against what the group consensus is. So um, I'm fine with adding this as, as all voting members, but I completely agree with Mr. Dwyer's characterization of this that, you know, th it will be a consensus that will be determining the board. For me, the voting members as board members is more a function of, okay, this kind of officially says we've come to consensus. The three of us are officially voting and now bringing it before the board. So it's, it's almost more of a formality, but that said, it's not a, you know, a sword I'm going to fall on. Um, the other thing I was um, going to say is that uh, to Mr. Dwyer's point, and I will say whether it's the original commission statement or my amendment gets approved, I am enthusiastic about this however it is. And I absolutely hear Mr. Dwyer's points about the bargaining units. Um, I've spoken with some teachers. I've spoken with some um, uh, union leadership and I think they are have tremendous ideas and they have a I couldn't disagree more with thinking of them as just being self-interested in fact in many ways their self-interest if you even want to characterize it that way is what makes them powerfully motivated they know what's at stake as well anyone paying attention knows what's at stake in the state of Connecticut and I think they are powerfully motiv motivated to be very creative and really think I will say though that any committees like these that have existed before I ha I'll admit I'd also thought there's usually support staff there that I had seen someone as being that because I agree for us to just go off on some rude route and not get staff feedback I did think that was an integral part of this um, mm -hmm. but again so those those are my comments to the 
comments we've had. Uh, can, I, I'd like to suggest to the board that we have, I'll say, two ancillary questions that have come up to make it consistent should we use ad hoc and whether they should be voting or not. If I could ask that we make those as separate motions once we settle on the membership, uh, then we'll go back to determine whether we want to do that. Mr. Llewellyn. From participating in the conversation at the last meeting, I thought the purpose of this committee was to look at a broad uh, spectrum of, of ideas and kind of go deep on those. Uh, I think that limiting the size of this committee is going to make that job uh, more difficult. What I had thought was going to occur was items were going to be kind of thrown out there, call it, I don't know, 10, whatever they happen to be, and then the group was going to divide up and you were going to have members of each of those kind of subcommittees uh, moving forward. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that with, with, a, with a smaller group that you can be as engaged in uh, as many different avenues. So, uh, you know, once again, I think we're concentrating uh, kind of the thoughts back toward the center again, and we're excluding the public um, more so. And, and, you know, I mean, I understand, uh, Ms. Kelly, how you're, you're, you're seeing it that way, but I think at the end of the day, uh, you know, the vote is going to carry the day. And I know you say you can't see them. Uh, members uh, kind of voting against things that are said, but uh, depending upon how the group is set up, you know, different voices may not get heard. Uh, Mrs. Eileen Lou McCormick. Um, I, I would agree with the comments that Mr. Llewellyn just stated, and I'd also like to um, just talk about the size. I would be supportive of staying probably on the larger end. Of, of say 15 members, even if it is, we're, we're already a group of nine, and we managed to have a fairly cordial, if not very festive, conversation every so often. Um, so if we add, you know, another five or six people, I don't think that that is the end of the world, particularly since a lot of it is brainstorming. And so the more feedback we have, I think, the better. And we're going to find that half of the people will speak and half of the people will sit there quietly. Um, so even if we have many people in the room. Um, I think it's the ideas that they bring, and they'll probably quickly get winnowed down to a handful. Um, in terms of the voting issue, I would say that this isn't binding anyways. So if people are going to spend all those hours, let them have their say. If they're the one person who says, no, I don't agree with that, they will feel some pride in being able to express their opinion. I believe we should have all of them be voting members. It's not as if it's binding upon the town or the Board of Ed. We can redirect anyways. But I think it's also interesting information if they make a recommendation only to find that it was, whatever, a 9-6 vote or something even closer, right? So if we find that it was a tiebreaker, then it's kind of like, well, wow, you know, that wasn't really a compelling, whereas if we only have three people presenting and we don't see the full count in the viewpoints, we won't know if everybody was unanimous on this issue or if in fact it was really tight or maybe perhaps just the opinion of the three who are recommending to us. So again, I would say for purposes of open communication and the greatest feedback possible, I would say let, let the members be voting. Why not? I, I don't see that it hurts anything. And I would always say be more inclusive than exclusive. And when I say inclusive, I don't mean inclusive to the people who are the friends of the chair or to the three members of the Board of Ed or to the union or to the town boards. I mean, let's be open. If we want to include senior citizens, let's have a senior citizen in there. Let's talk about the issues. Honestly, let's hear the problems. I think we only hurt ourselves if we don't try to be honest and listen to all opinions. We may lose out on the best ideas. Um, is there anybody else that wishes to make a comment? And then I'll go to Mrs. Maxim Kennelly for any final comment, and then I'll go to the public. Anybody else wishes to make a comment on the amendment that is in front of us at the moment? No hands, Mrs. Maxson. Do you want to make some final comments? My, my final comment, I cannot state this any more strenuously. This in absolutely no way is shutting out the public. Every meeting has public comment. The focus groups are entirely about comment, uh, public comment. It is about having a committee that can function, that can agree to a calendar, can agree to a set. And I'm not even worried about the rules. I'm worried about getting a group that can see this forward. Um, as I said, whether the amendment passes or not, I am enthusiastic that this committee is being formed. Um, and, 
but in no way is this limiting community input. Okay. So, members of the public, uh, uh, you will have an opportunity to talk about the main motion, uh, but first we have to deal with the amendment. Um, and so I think you had copies that some members of the public had. Uh, so does anybody wish to comment on the amendment and the amendment only? Please come forward, state your name and address. Bob Smoller, president of the FEA. Um, Self-interest notwithstanding, um, I believe the focus of this committee is operational efficiency. And um, I can't conceive of a committee that would be focused on operational efficiency without a permanent member who understands how the operation is currently operating. And there is nobody on any town body that has an intimate understanding of how we operate in the school district. That is primarily the people who are closest to the education of our children, which is the staff and the administrators, certainly the paraprofessionals and others. Um, and if you're going to be think making thoughts uh, on a committee with real-time discussion taking place, I would certainly think that you would want real-time feedback on whether something's workable, not workable, how it might play out, just providing some information or suggestions in a focus group, that gets left as soon as the focus group is over and you don't have the opportunity to get real-time feedback as the items are being discussed. So if you really do want to come out with a good outcome uh, regarding operational efficiency, I would highly suggest that you have members on the committee that have intimate knowledge of how the operation is currently being operated. Thank you. Thank you. Other members of the public wish to come forward? State your name and address. Susie, I'm Esco 123 Rygate Road. Um, I'm kind of scaring myself because I'm agreeing with people that I don't usually agree with. Um, <laughs> um, so yes, I agree with Chairman Dwyer and, and I, I want the record to show that. Um, <laughs> that I agree that with the goals committee, you know, we, we had a very diverse group of people. Um, it was a Board of Ed driven with the Board of Ed chair and we did not have voting rights. In fairness, I will say that I felt respected on that committee, that my voice was heard whether or not I had a role as a voting member or not. My biggest concern, and I appreciate with what um, the board member who drew this amendment um, is attempting to do, because honestly, after watching this um, on Fair TV when this was presented, I am concerned because the, the volume of this compared to just goals is extensive. And I think that um, while the amendment is trying to create subcommittees, which maybe would be helpful, this whole itinerary needs to be brought down. And I agree with Mr. Smoller that in goals, we had a representative from the administration that reported to the superintendent of concerns that we had or issues we had brought up with respect to that. I do think there has to be administration um, represented in this. My concern is this ad hoc committee seems to be very top heavy, RTM, Board of Selectmen, um, and other town boards, and I'm not really sure who we're trying to work this with. Is If this is to convince the other boards that the Board of Ed budget is worthy of their support, or is this to have the public participating in a conversation about the goals and directions that the public thinks the Board of Ed should be looking at. And that's what's not clear in this. So thank you. Thank you. Other members wish to come forward? Please state your name and address. Hi, Tina Brown, 35 Quaker Lane. Um, so I'm a resident and I'm also a teacher and I've realized that our board is unique and that we do have two teachers on this board. Um, however, let's say they're not on the committee of three from the Board of Ed. Very, I can't say what other people do in their job. 
I can't tell you what a lawyer does. I can complain that the lawyer charges so much money and, you know, for 15 minutes and he only talked to me for six minutes or whatever it is. People can't, don't know what teachers do. They have a lot of ideas and they express those ideas on what teachers do and what on principals do and curriculum leaders do. But when you're talking about reorganization within the school, those are the people that know how it works. Those are the people, as Mr. Smoller said, can tell you, well, that's a really great idea, but that'll never work because of this, this, and this. So you have to have those people there. I, I don't have an opinion on whether or not they have to be on the 8 to 10 or 10 to 15 or if they're an ad hoc committee, but they have to be a part of the process and they have to be listened to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else wish to come forward, speak on the amendment and the amendment only? Uh, seeing nobody, uh, back to the board. Uh, again, I'll go to Mrs. Maxson Kennelly if she wishes to make any opening comment, uh, and then anybody else that wants to make a final comment, and then we'll go to vote. Mrs. Maxson Kennelly. Um, yeah, I, I want to reiterate again from my experience with policy, my experience with the other committees that we have had during my six years on here, there was the any group like this was always staff supported. Um, and I will when I crafted this language, it was with that, you know, my understanding again, obviously I was mistaken in my understanding on the voting issue, but um, so I completely understand uh, the points raised in public comment regarding needing to have some real time feedback and it had never occurred to me that that wouldn't be a part of this. Now, the decision of whether if <coughs> You know, if, if to get this to pass and get it to be a little more under control, we wanted to add them as voting members versus support staff, such as what was with um, the Educational Goals Committee. Um, I don't have a strong opinion, but I couldn't agree more that to do this without real-time staff input um, could waste a lot of people's time. But as I said, I already said it once before, and I'll say it again now, it never occurred to me that there wouldn't be staff there. So how that gets worked in, I don't have a strong opinion on. Okay, the third line down on the process, you'll see that uh, this actually names the superintendent of schools who will provide staff leadership to the committee. And in my discussions with the superintendent, um, she will draw in other staff on different issues as may be required. So she won't be the only person there, but uh, uh, there, will, there is a staff leadership to the committee. Other board members that wish to uh, make a comment prior to the vote? No. Mr. Llewellyn. I just want to kind of paraphrase something that uh, Mr. Schmoller said that I think is important. Uh, the thoughts, uh, th th thoughts are left as the focus group ends, and you need to have members on the committee. Uh, you know, I think that is my one concern with having a smaller group with focus committees. I, I think that things will be said, but with a smaller group, things will be filtered. So uh, I think we should have larger groups. Seeing no other board members raise their hand, um, uh, the only change you made to this, uh, again, dealing with the voting and ad hoc issue after we deal with the membership uh, by separate motion, was it reached 8 to 10, correct? Correct. Uh, the motion is, uh, the amendment is in front of you. Do board members need it to be reread. It's in front of you without any changes at the moment. I don't see anybody's hand going up. So therefore, all in favor of the amendment as proposed by Mrs. Maxson Kennelly, please raise your hand. Mrs. Gerber, Ms. Pitko, Mrs. Maxson Kennelly, Mr. Asa, all opposed. Uh, Mrs. Eileen Lou McCormick, Mr. Mark Patton, Ms. Donna Carnell, Philip Dwyer, and Mr. Llewellyn. The motion uh, fails four to five. F yeah. Um, so let me deal by unanimous consent because it sounds as though uh, that if we say by unanimous consent, wherever the word advisory committee is we shall make that consistent and make it ad hoc. Is, is that a, by unanimous consent, that amendment is made? Okay, that's one down. And on the issue of voting members, do we have unanimous consent that a sentence should be added to make all committee Just members? Add hmm? Just add a word. Just add voting. Okay, where's, what word do you want to, where, where's that? The second line of membership. 
The Board of Ed Board Chair will also recruit voting members. Okay, voting members. We'll also recruit voting members. So by unanimous consent, adding that word to the original motion. Seeing no objection, so is it, ordered. Whoop. Is it better to put the voting there or put the voting the committee will have X number of voting members and put the voting there? Or put it in both places? I was reading it as it should go at the end, but I guess it doesn't really matter. We could put it both places, 12 to 15 voting members. Okay, by unanimous consent, so ordered. One, one piece of clarification, please. Yep. So in this original language, we still have uh, uh, at-large members of the general community. Correct. Okay. So when we're talking about them, they can also be voting members. Correct. Perfect. Thank mm -hmm. you. So uh, any, uh, we're back to the main motion with the ad hoc being used in place of wherever it says ad, uh, advisory. And we're adding voting members and voting members at two locations under membership. Uh, any uh, final comments that board members wish to make? on the main motion before I go to the public. Mr. Llewellyn. I, I, I do come back to my point that uh, the chair is soliciting or recruiting uh, members. You know, one of the things you did say before was, you know, you hadn't heard back from the RTC. Um, uh, so no, no, the RTM. Oh, I'm sorry, the I thought Republican you said RTC. The Republican Caucus of the RTM. Okay, yeah. the, okay the Republican Caucus of the RTM. Yes. Yeah. But it, it gets back into the whole politics of it all. It's the Republican side of the RTM you hadn't heard back from. Um, you know, I, I almost think that, each member should be able to, you know, nominate someone to the committee. At least then you'll have a little bit more diversity, other than one individual getting to kind of hand pick uh, folks. So yeah. I kind of throw that out for discussion. Um, I have no objection to uh, board members saying I'd like to advance this name. I have had two members of the general community, three, um, who have. Uh, been uh, either two self-nominated themselves and one other was nominated by somebody else. So uh, nominations are welcome and then we'll see what total group we have and see what uh, the background is of the elected officials who have come on and try and make sure there's a balance uh, based on the uh, recommendations for some of the elected bodies for those who are hoping that there will be a, um, I'll say a contrarian vo voice, um, I think that you'll find that it's there. But yes, this is Maxim Canelli. For the process you just described, um, would that be a board member would say, go out to a member of the RTM or a member at large and just, if it's a member of those town bodies, that would be encouraging that member to speak to that mem person's leadership, correct? Yeah, it's the leadership that I am relying on to, uh, and I am using the term recommend because our bylaws do say that they have to be appointed by the board chair, but effectively their recommendation is an appointment from my perspective. So that's the only reason I use the word appointment because um, technically I'm, I'm supposed to do that. But I'm relying on the leadership to bring a name forward and then put, add them to the list accordingly. Uh, Mrs. Lou McCormick. So then back to the question of politics. So when you're saying leadership, you mean the leadership of the particular political party or bargaining unit or what have you? And in, the in, in the instance of the bargaining units, uh, I've gone to the leadership of the bargaining units. Right. Um, in the instance of the RTM, I asked the majority and minority caucus leaders to do it. Uh, I asked the chair of the Board of Finance and the first selectman in the case of those two bodies. Okay. Um, so that's what I mean by leadership. Right now, uh, it is, I think it's three to three who happen to be D's and happen to be R's. So can I just clarify? I just want to make sure that not more than half of this group is actually politically driven. Um, so the Board of Selectmen nominates one or two? Well, Board of I Finance, think that'll be impossible. Two? Because three from the Board of Ed, one from the Board of Selectmen, one from the Board of Finance, two from the RTM, we're already up to seven. So well, I think okay. it'll be hard 
Unless well, I mean, wouldn't necessarily say that the Board of Ed necessarily is okay. political. You're not counting those. Yeah, I'm not counting us. I'm just saying from the other, from like the RTC, the RTM, the Board of Selectmen. Again, that sounds like eight. The RTC. Again, not the oh, RTC. Oh, no, not RTC. The RTM. The R just the RTM. The RTC. Okay, so the arm of it. So they would like be nominating two, right? The RTM is nominating two. Right. They and the Board been, of Finance, been, uh, one. Asked one. to nominate two. Okay, so that's three. And then Board of Selectmen, one. Okay, so that's four. So then only four out of potentially up to 15. And the Board of Finance, did you, is that included in your oh, That was one, right? Yeah, one. So one, one, and two, so that's four? Correct. Okay, so then that's, that seems like it's okay. So four out of 15. And then for the members at large, um, how, and the student representatives as well, is that having to be nominated by, say, a principal, or can they just themselves step up and say, I'm just really interested in this? Uh, anybody can self-nominate. Uh, my intention, so that you know, was to go to the current student representatives to this board and give them the first opportunity to join this group if they wish, and then rely on the headmasters of our two high schools to present one male and one female name. That, that's the process I was going to use. But it's, it's, it is open to any student who then decides that they are extremely interested. Uh, that's, I think that's true of, of um, uh, the community at large as well. Uh, I know when the, with the uh, Board of Finance, uh, two members of that body had expressed interest and one name got brought forward. Uh, I think several names were thought of at the RTM, um, and, um, and so th th uh, more than one person will ask to be involved. And, uh, and the process then would be to send their information yes. to you yes. personally. And same with the members and the general community. Correct. And, and who would make the decision as to who is selected? You uh, would. So you yes. would interview them. <laughs> I, I would look at their resume and and look at their background. Um, this is a committee that's going to look at program, finance, uh, facilities, and staff. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're looking at the four main groups of what an organization does, uh, and so I'll want to make sure that uh, people who are on the committee bring some skill set in one of those four areas. Mm -hmm. And just so I understand, so we have four from the kind of um, uh, other kind elected of, bodies. Yeah, other elected bodies area. And then from the school bargaining unit representatives, how many do we anticipate? Two. One certified, one non-certified. And that will represent all of them. And is that sufficient to represent all the interests? So that would be, okay. And then do we have somebody specifically who would be an expert on infrastructure within that? Or is that supposed to be the certified, non-certified? I would think that that would be different. Until individual. I get all the names in, I won't know the answer to that question. Okay, but we are targeting ideally to have somebody who is familiar with the infrastructure as a voting member within this committee. Um, yes, uh, depending on the, the non-certified staff person, if it came from a supervisory level of our custodian union, then clearly that expertise would be there. But if suddenly the only person came forward was one of our secretaries, which is also a valid point of view, then I think I would have to look at the at-large membership to see who from the community um, had that kind of infrastructure and facilities background and favor that person so we get that skill set on the committee. And might the superintendent be recommending individuals for this committee as well outside of just the bargaining units? Uh, the she might superintendent be will recommend names to me as well, uh, uh, but we've asked the two bargaining units or the bargaining units to recommend their own names. The superintendent is not choosing who represents the bargaining unit. Correct. But just separately as a point of infrastructure operational efficiency, she may have. Right. So I wanted to see that. And then Everybody members in this audience is welcome to send me a name. Everybody in the community is welcome to nominate a name. and. And the more we have, the more we can make sure there is a balance of skill sets on this committee. And you'll be asking for a resume, and we'll be offering each one of them an interview? Is that how this is going to work? 
I just want to understand what the process is for selection. Well, clearly, if I, right now, after two weeks, I've had three names suggested. And clearly, uh, if I have a dozen names suggested, then um, I'll find a way to, uh, uh, to look at their resume and meet with them and make a decision. Okay. Some of the names recommended I may know already, as people at this board know a lot of people in the community. Okay. All right. So you'll be the clearinghouse for all the information, and if you get more than the 15, then you will, mo in all likelihood, offer interviews and review the resumes. Correct? <coughs> That's the process. Um, I just want to make sure that these spots aren't going to be filled with the first person who you know, as no. opposed to looking at... No. Right. But I am not going to wait a month before we start putting this committee into action. Um, and so we may start with only one uh, at-large person to give time for other at-large people to suggest names. Uh, because one, we need to have this committee start. Uh -huh. And I don't want to wait for the very last member to be named before we start the group working. Which brings me to the question of, so what is the deadline for submitting the name and having the board, of, I mean, having this committee officially be named? Um, uh, I was going to uh, name them by the end of this week based on the names that have been already submitted to me. Um, and I'm hoping to have a meeting in the beginning of October, middle of October, as a organizational and orientation meeting, uh, but that does not mean that uh, somebody couldn't be added to the committee at the second or the third meeting of, of the group. Okay, so by the end of this week, um, anybody who wants to be nominated should have their name submitted to you, and a resume can potentially follow once their name is submitted. Uh, Yes, I would like it by the end of this week, but that's not mandatory. If suddenly somebody hears through the grapevine and suddenly comes to me the end of next week, um, th that probably will still be enough time. Okay. My and guess mm -hmm. is by the uh, end of October, mm -hmm. uh, this full committee will be formed. Because I might, it might not be right away that I get somebody from the Republican Caucus of the RTM. Um, <coughs> Um, I know who the certified representative will be, but I don't know who the non-certified representative will be. And so uh, each body that is being asked to recommend uses their own process to decide how to come up with a name. So I'm assuming that somewhere between now and the end of October, all of the, the whole committee will be formed. And for the student representatives, are you limiting it to 12th graders, or how is that working? I was going to limit it to high school students, but. So 9th through 12th? I was, I was going to, I'm going to ask first the members who are on this Board of Ed if they wish to participate, uh, and they're generally 11th or 12th graders, okay. uh, and if they all uniformly say thanks but no thanks, uh, then I'm going to go to the two headmasters, and if the headmaster finds a very energetic, mature, wonderful ninth grader <laughs> that wants to participate in his is uh, m wants, wants to do this, I'll leave it in the headmaster's uh, best opinion as to who's the best student from their two high schools. Okay. Thank you. Other comments uh, that the board wishes to make? Uh, last comment from Mr. Patton, and I'll go to the audience for uh, comments. So I guess two, two questions. One, so there's, after the kind of to follow up on what Ms. Lou McCormick has been uh, questioning in terms of how the, the different members will be scrutinized and selected. Is it, I know it's not, it doesn't seem to be policy for ad hoc committee members to be approved by the board once the, kind of the slate is in front of you. Correct. Is that something that we would want to entertain or we don't want to go down that road? Personally? Um, if you tried to go in that route, you would be doing it in violation of our bylaws, and you'd technically have to change the bylaws to allow for that. That answers that question. You don't need to go any further. So um, my second question is more of, uh, I guess, through the chair, if I could maybe ask uh, a sense of the body kind of question. We didn't seem to, to 
um, explore the, the number limitation issue much more. So is anybody in favor of putting a specific number instead of having a range as to a maximum of, again, whatever it is, maximum of 5, 10, 15, 20, whatever, whatever it is, or? So right now the motion says 12 to 15. 12 to 15. Is there any board member that wishes to change that range? I would be in favor of, at first I was going to say a maximum Sorry, of 12. Can I, can I okay. finish my, Mr. Patton asked a question. Uh, you would like a smaller committee? I had. Board. It was voted on. It was voted down. Done. Uh, anybody else wishes on this side of the table want to follow up on Mr. Patton's yeah. idea of talking about these two? So again, so, so I'm asking so, for a sense of the body. Before, so, we're not voting on anything. Just, you know, so, so, so the answer is apparently no. Jen, Jen has said no. Jessica said had no. just said no. Um, so my, my only comment would be that instead of having a range of 12 to 15, that we just put a maximum of 15 on it that way if you get 10 you can still or 8 you can still start your committee because if it says 12 to 15 and you haven't gotten your 12 yet technically you can't operate your committee so uh, I'm, I'll ask before unanimous consent uh, instead of having have 12 to 15 that you could say have up to 15 does that make sense to people I don't know that makes a lot of difference but is there unanimous consent to put in the word up? Change 12 no. to up. To change 12 to up? No. no. Then we, okay, so you'd have to make it as a formal motion. Okay. So you're uh, not so, going to or you are? Uh, going I to? will. Okay. So uh, I'll make a motion to uh, make amendments to the membership section of the second to last sentence where it says the committee will have up to 15 members. Up to 15 voting members. Voting members. Change 12 to up. Change 12 to up, correct. That's a motion. Do we have a second? It dies for lack of a second. Seriously. Okay. Um, any other final comments before we go to the public? Mr. Asa. Uh, I wanted to <coughs> take a second to thank the public for their comments, um, and none of what was said goes unheard by me, I think, or anybody. I can't speak for anyone else, but um, I think to get across my fear here, I, I think people have picked up on it, I think we've been elected to do a job, and in the coming months and years, we're going to have to make some very, very tough decisions, potentially, um, that some people will be happy with, some people won't. Um, and some of these decisions may include what we're talking about here with regards to structural change. Um, but I think for me, I think we need to focus. We were elected to do a job and we need to focus on that. And I, I like the idea of getting input from the community, from the FEA, from the administration, from, from everybody that's been mentioned tonight. Um, but. <coughs> I don't necessarily know, to me, if this is the right way to go about it by forming a committee. Yep, thank you. Uh, with no further comment from the board prior to the vote, is there any member of the public that wishes to come forward? This is on the main motion, so anybody that has spoken on the amendment is still welcome to come forward. So uh, please come forward and state your name and address. Suzanne Mesco, 123 Rygate Road. Um, wow, it's like a night of firsts. I agree um, with the last speaker. Um, the intent I get, I get what you're intending to do. My problem started with structural changes. I mean, just sitting at a redistricting meeting, we saw how Mr. Flynn's comment of structural changes at a Board of Finance meeting during budget was interpreted to be one thing by some people and one thing by others. So already in the committee purpose, I, I worry that you skewing in different directions. I would have really, instead of having a committee, would have rather have seen um, some sort of survey of some magnitude offered with a set of priorities of thoughts that the Board of Ed was considering 
under some of these topics instead of basically opening the front door and saying to everybody, hey, what do you think about facilities and teachers? And I mean, you hear enough of it at budget time where everyone starts nitpicking that we have too many of this and not enough of that and too many books and not enough books. And you know, you can pick someone on either side of this equation. And I get the intent. And the intent is great. I just think that this is a basket that I don't know what you're going to get from this. Like, I don't know that this might just be too broad to really get the feedback that you're trying to get. Um, so I caution that I, while I, I understand what we wanted to do and I understand the direction you're trying to go in, I hesitate that this is not going to give the conclusions that you're trying to get. And, and I don't even know what that feedback is going to be useful for for this board. I think the board needs to make some decisions and, and make a list of things that they're even considering and then let the public this, you know, contact the senior center, have a town hall at the senior center, you know, have it as, as, a, as an open town hall with RTM members. But you guys tell us what you think you want to do. And then we can then help you with that process. But to do this, I think, is just way too wide open. And I, I think this is, while the intent was good, I think this is a really bad idea. Thank you. Anybody else wish to come forward and state your name and address? Thank you. Good evening. I'm Jason Bluestein. I'm the principal of Bear Elementary School. I'm also the uh, president of the Administrators Union, the FSAA. Um, my, my only, I appreciate the conversation about how many members you know you want to have on the committee. Uh, my pitch would be just to have a representative from the administrative uh, ranks, a representative from the teachers, and have a non-certified rep too. I think all of them bring a unique perspective to the conversations that you're looking to have. And I think limiting it to just two, one certified and one non-certified, probably wouldn't be enough. So I, I understand the debate about how many people you want to have on, um, but I would just make a pitch to have an administrator, a teacher, and, an, and a non-certified person at minimum, just because I think they bring a different perspective to the conversations you're looking to have. So thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Anybody else wish to come forward, state your name and address? Christine Vitale, 254 Vernon Hill Road. Um, I'm just going to reiterate my comments at the last meeting. I still feel ne like it needs to be two committees. One, um, to really focus on the immediate. I think the town bodies are looking for a list from you <coughs> to address the budget challenge that we're going to be facing next year. And I think that committee should be focused. I think it should be small. The, the members on it should be um, elected officials with you know, members from the teachers union and the administrators union with guidance from staff. In terms of long-term plans, um, I think that a lot of different stakeholders need to be involved. But before that work is even done, I would like to see some um, recommendations from the administration and from the school district. I'm hearing that the FEA already has ideas. I'd like to hear what those ideas are. Um, it just seems like there's an elephant in the room that people are, I've been hearing so many different scenarios that I think would like to hear them maybe voiced in a public forum and then kind of decide what we're talking about because right now I'm sorry take a breath right now I feel like it really is a free-for-all and it's really concerning because I don't think any work is going to get done thank you thank you anybody else wish to come forward if not, back to the board. Any final comments the board members wish to make? Yeah, no. So, Mr. Llewellyn, you get the uh, last uh, word. Well, I pulled up the bylaws. because Jackson Kennelly wishes to speak, so she sure. gets the last word. Go ahead. No, no. You Mr. Llewellyn. Um, <laughs> so, you, you kept referencing the bylaws, so I decided to pull them up. Um, is this an advisory committee or an ad hoc? What we just said is that they are synonymous. The advisory committee um, is per our bylaws, advisory committees consisting of three board members appointed by the chair may be established by the majority of the board from time to time, so on and so forth. It doesn't say that we can actually have non-board members on these committees if it's going to be an advisory committee, which we just said was synonymous. 
whole the board shall provide a charge to the advisory committee which shall include the preparation of a written report and recommendations for the board's consideration within a specified period of time upon the advisory committee's presentation of the report and recommendations to the board for consideration the advisory committee shall be deemed dissolved and only the board shall take further action so I'm not sure that our bylaws allow us to open it up as a I committee don't have per a copy se. Of the bylaws, but last time I read them, and it, it allows for the appointment of other community members as may be appropriate to the issue at hand. Ms. Gerber, do you know? Do you have the bylaws? No. Nope. That's the advisory committee. You said there's an ad hoc. The ad -hoc well, we said they were one and one of the same. We did not. We changed it. To ad hoc, correct, but. In the past, it was synonymous, and that's why there was unanimous consent to do that. And I did do a search for ad hoc and didn't see it. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But I just question the formation. Thank you. Wait, here we go. Am I reading an old version? Um, I don't know, but the second paragraph of that, thank you, Mrs. Gerber. The chairman and the superintendent or his de delegate shall be ex officio members of the advisory committees, and the chairman may appoint ex officio advisors from the community for assistance in gathering information, preparing reports, and making recommendations. And so that paragraph is what caused me to say the board members actually cast the vote, uh, but the advisory committee, committee members have generally acted by consensus. Uh, this board, by changing by unanimous consent the motion, uh, has said that they should not be ex officio, but voting. So it does, it, uh, it does allow gotcha. for, Yep. Right? So taken. So I guess the only question then is, is, is the voting legitimate or not legitimate? Yeah, if this board based on wants the bylaws. to make them voting, they can make them voting, in my view. In contradict. But the by by bylaws say that they can gather information, they can prepare reports, and they can make recommendations. Any other board members wish to make a comment before we vote on the motion that's in front of us? The main main amendment, the main motion, which is effectively adopting the, the uh, commission statement um, uh, as changed to replace the word advisory with ad hoc and putting voting members in, in two locations. Mrs. Maxson can um, I don't disagree that this has the potential to be a somewhat messy process. The, we are. This is a whole different era for Board of Eds in which they are serving. Um, and I guess what it is is that I would rather start the conversation than keep trying to find the right, you know, bullet to put in the right gun, the fire to solve everything. It, it's, you know, and it could be that as the, this committee rolls along that in reports coming back, they make the suggestion for a revision to the commission statement, which I think um, the board at that time would be open to hearing. But I just think it would be a mistake to not get the ball rolling. The town expects this conversation to happen. We, no one has spoken against the idea of this conversation happening, and I accept that it's going to come uh, with a little bit of messiness. And I, I have faith that this ad hoc committee, these people who are volunteering and who care and understand what an issue this is, that they're going to bring organization to it that they put their stamp on um, and carry forward. And as needs arise, and they aren't suited to fulfill all those needs, we will get that feedback and, and adjust accordingly. Um, but it would just be a mistake to not get started. Um, okay, I, I, I don't want to drag this conversation out to where I think I'm on the last comment and then another hand goes up. Is, is uh, Mrs. Lumacormick the last speaker? Forever hold your peace, Mrs. Lumacormick. So in taking in the comments from the public regarding this uh, concern about a chaotic process, I think that, um, in fact, this is really a fact-gathering kind of a process. And the board, there's nothing to stop the board, I would imagine, to continue to create our own list of things to investigate. And in fact, is the board could, in fact, charge the committee with including the five whatever ideas that we have for them to investigate and consider 
in tandem with other ideas that they have and give the pros and cons for all of them, which allow them to help do further research and kind of public information and sentiment gathering for us on our behalf. Right. And so I don't believe that this formation is anything other than adding the public element and including that other perspective as part of the official process for the Board of Ed. I don't know that it <coughs> relieves the Board of Ed from its own duty of creating its own list of ideas. And therefore, I don't think that it would create chaos. I guess if it w we were only reliant on their opinion, that would be one thing. But I would imagine that the board and the superintendent and staff would be able to coincidentally also work on ideas and be in communication with the committee. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. And I would go so far as to say that, that um, Mr. Llewellyn, I want you to hear this. <laughs> that it doesn't have to be a majority of the board that brings an idea forward. You know, if an individual board member says, I think the committee ought to look at this, you ought to feel free to send that in to the superintendent or go to a committee meeting and bring it up directly at the committee meeting. I don't think any member of this board is prevented from making any suggestions directly to this committee. So having said that, uh, are we ready for a vote? Um, the motion in front of us, where's my uh, official, is that the Board of Education hereby moves to establish an advisory committee on operational effectiveness per BOE bylaws article 2 section 4 paragraph B and approve the charge as amended as described in the commission statement per enclosure number 1. Uh, all in favor of that motion please raise your hand. Um, uh, uh, Mrs. Lou McCormick, Mr. Patton, uh, Ms. Carnell, Mrs. Gerber, myself, Philip Dwyer, Ms. Pitko, Mrs. Maxon Canelli, Mr. Llewellyn, all opposed? Mr. Acer, thank you very much. The motion passes 8 to 1. Uh, good discussion. Um, I hope to get the list out as soon as possible if I can get one or two more names so that um, I have it as complete as possible. Uh, on to uh, the next item, financial review of 2016-17. Uh, do you wish to make any comments before Ms. Mar Mrs. Mar Mansell comes up? Um, just thank you to Ms. Mansell for excellent work at the end of uh, last year. As you remember, about halfway through the year, we were in quite a, quite a large hole, and it took huge efforts last year um, to really work to get through this budget. So thank you, Ms. Mansell, and it's all yours. Okay. Um, I'm going to concentrate on this, um, this sheet with the budget transfers with the blue on it. Um, you've seen uh, columns one and two before. Uh, column one is the, the projected um, balance, um, which was, um, com comes from this uh, sheet that you've also seen with the, the projected um, savings and uh, accounts with deficits that brought us to the, the 550. Um, Column two are the uh, transfers you already approved. Column three is the actual balance as of um, June 30th. Uh, we brought it down to about $90,000. We have to, um, as I explained in my memo, we, we still need a balance at the end of June for um, expenses that were incurred in, um, in the fiscal year, but we haven't yet uh, been uh, invoiced for or um, staffing uh, cost. Um, column four is the actual balance. Even though we, we, we close on June 30th, we call it a soft close, after those other expenses are, um, are known in July, we actually have to close the end of July um, and had ended up with a balance of um, roughly almost $1,500. Um, those are the expenses that are reported. We have to do this in July so that we can report it on the um, state report that's due July, uh, June, yeah, September 1st. Um, we were able to, um, as we balance things towards the end of the year, make purchases that were um, for uh, items that were on hold. Uh, that million dollars that was, we've, was frozen for a good part of the year. Uh, we were able to um, make purchases in the, the areas that uh, they were budgeted in, um, mainly uh, capital, um, maintenance projects, and instructional um, materials. 
um, and that's that's the the nuts and bolts of uh, what happened at the end of the year uh, if there's any questions questions from board members on the year-end report Mrs. Ms. Pitkin? I think the question is through the chair to uh, dr. Jones if the state doesn't pass the budget come October 1st do we not get our ECS funding and then that impacts all of the projects and everything that we projected and, and so I'll ask the superintendent to answer that question but I'll encourage board members to focus on the item that's in front of us at the moment which is last year's balance um, ECS does flow through the town for us so um, we have really counted on zero going into this year because we knew uh, that it was going to be this type of a year and because we have 2.3 million frozen right now it will stay that way and we will not spend those dollars until we know what what the budget is doing this year questions on the year-end report mr. Llewellyn uh, the third paragraph that says throughout the month of July wages earned and invoices incurred within the fiscal year were paid with 1617 funds mm -hmm. so was that a carry forward so we could get ahead in the current fiscal with payroll in anticipation of the cuts to come uh, no, I'm not sure what that, that sentence means no that um, that column three the actual balance at the end of June that 90,000 we I'm sorry I was reading paragraph three yeah on, paragraph on three page. on here yeah yeah right sorry that's that's referring to column three okay with that balance of about 90,000 mm -hmm. at the end of June that's still 1617 um, funds that we expend in July for um, work that happened in in the end of you know in June that we process in July it's it's got nothing to do with um, the 17 18 year it, ha it, it has to do with things that happened in June okay. that we're paying for in July so throughout the month of July wages earned and invoices incurred within the fiscal year the prior fiscal year not the current Thank fiscal you. year yep. yeah, prior. that was my confusion Thank yep. you very much <laughs> Yeah, Got so it. for board members who know how payroll works, if you work on the 28th, 29th, 30th, that's part of that accounting period, but generally you don't get the actual check until sometime in July. Other questions from uh, board members? Mr. Patton? I thought we were making one there. You mentioned uh, in your opening paragraph there about uh, instructional materials, and we were able to obviously we know maintenance projects were held off and then we could do what we could do um, in terms of um, I want to I want to say direct education related things obviously everything is directly or indirectly related to education but uh, things like instructional materials or maybe through the chair to the superintendent um, were there any things like that that we could not pay for with the with the shortfall in terms of things like instructional materials that we needed that we had to push off that's a great question I have to go back and pull the list because last between last year and this year we've had so much frozen I would really want to check the list because most of last year it was just over a million and our goal by the end of the year was trying to make sure that when we knew we were going to be okay um, to be able to purchase anything that we knew had been budgeted um, which the board had directed us to do when we when you first saw that balance that was I think was that the early June one or May um, but I would have to actually give you I would have to go back and look at the exact list yeah I mean, we felt like we actually did very well at the end of last year being able to take care of what we needed to do and then we started looking forward to this year and freezing what was happening in the summer but that's this year's budget okay yeah I'd be curious to see if there was you know whether it's um, supplemental textbooks you know minor amounts of books that were you know <laughs> damaged and had to be replaced or supplemental materials for an entire class that we're going to hold off on like just to kind of get an idea of what we did and what we couldn't do so thanks any other comments or questions from board members mrs maxson canelli um just to follow up on that um first uh, to mr dwyer is it um am i correct that the october that first october meeting will be talking about budget priorities such as they are correct so if I through the chair to dr. Jones if, if we could have a, a recap well a specific recap of all of the items then frozen because I think that might be um, good yes, yeah. well a re review of last year and what so far was frozen for this year I think it'd be good to have that list up in front of us you know yeah. 
to assess for pri as part of that priority discussion. And, and I presume you'd want to make that part of the board packet yes, so you'd please. have a chance to look at it before the board meeting. Any other comments on the uh, year-end financial statement? Uh, seeing none. Um, we'll move on to the next agenda item, which is the first reading of policy 5113, attendance, excuses, dismissal. Uh, Mrs. Maxson Canale. Uh, just very briefly, I want to make very clear to the board that the policy committee looked at nothing in this entire policy except for this line. Um, so I'm obviously it is before us for a vote. I'm not about to restrict the board from looking at the rest of the policy if they so wished. I just want to make clear that we as a policy, this is um, a statute driven change that we made here. There's only a change on page one, I'll save you the flipping, um, that in terms of this definition of an absence had to be updated. Um, I just repeat, we looked at nothing else in the policy. We made, you know, just made sure to understand this change, made this change, and so we did not, if there's anything else of issue um, with the language in this policy, um, that's not something that was a part of our discussion. And as always, I welcome question. well, I welcome questions now as well as prior to the next meeting. Uh, Mrs. Gerber. Um, well, I did notice that we just um, approved a revised version of this policy less than a year ago, and I did go back and, and look to see what the old one looked like, and there were significant changes or additions made to that policy, but this one, so this is basically pretty updated. It's just that one line that's statute driven. Yes. So, okay. Uh, no other comment. This will be on the agenda uh, for the October 10th meeting uh, as a uh, voting item. Uh, on uh, business item number five, um, approval of the minutes, the recommended motion is that the Board of Education approve the minutes of the special meeting of September 12th, 2017. Uh, Mrs. Gerber makes the motion. Mrs. Uh, Maxson Canelli makes the uh, second. I'll pick you up on the second last set of minutes. Uh, any discussion among the board members on this? If none, all in favor of the uh, that the Board of Education approve the minutes of the special meeting of September 12th, 2017. Please raise your hand. It is unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, the second set of minutes is that the Board of Education approve the minutes of the regular meeting of September 12, 2017. I have a motion. Uh, Ms. Pitko uh, seconds it. Uh, any uh, discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Uh, Mr. Patton, Ms. Carnell, Mrs. Gerber, Philip Dwyer, uh, Ms. Pitko, Mr. Asa, Mrs. Maxson Kennelly, opposed? Uh, Mrs. Lou McCormick and Mr. Llewellyn. The uh, motion passes seven to two. Superintendent's report. Um, just a couple of things. Just an update on our two new pre-Ks at Stratfield are going fantastic. And um, just as a reminder, one of the items that was frozen in our budget for this current year was the permanent playground for the pre-K at that site. So um, the staff did do a terrific job putting in temporary, more little, when you think of little tykes um, type play area, and it's working really, really well. But just those two classes being uh, located next door to each other has just been a great benefit. So I just wanted the board to know. Also, we have our two new CLCs. One of them was at Osborne where they had already had the first CLC, but we also have um, the second one at Burr, and that's going terrific. And Mr. Bluestein, who spoke tonight, is hosting that program for us, and just delighted with how well that's working out. Um, our back-to-school nights, we have, uh, we've almost completed them all. We have two more this week, and I've had great feedback on those, and parents feel like they're really getting uh, terrific information from the schools. We will be sending our SBAC information out to parents next week. That's something everybody waits on this time of the year. And then just as a reminder, in October, we will have a meeting where we'll share district level results with the board and then also go over our district improvement plan and how that went for us last year. So thank you. Any questions for the superintendent on the topics covered? Mrs. Maxson Canale. Uh, just very quickly, I noticed um, I didn't believe that the Stratfield pre-K looked full. Is that still accepting enrollment? Um, it is still at Stratfield. Do you know the numbers, Mr. Cummings, or as of today? 16 in the morning and 13 in the afternoon and our ECC program is smaller right now as well because that's where the program will grow that was for the additional numbers thank you you're welcome other questions for the superintendent or comments Ms. Ms. Carnell um, Dr. Jones I think you said we have two meetings left for the parents to be at the 
at the schools, you know. So I think one of the first ones was uh, Fairfield Ludlow High School and every other school down on Quote Road. You couldn't, <laughs> you couldn't park. You couldn't move. I mean, people were just parking anywhere. And I was going to ask, maybe some of those schools you alternate because you. One of the, it was, uh, Roger Ludlow didn't have their open house, but they had their family picnic <laughs> the same night. So that's not the school district, that's PTA. Who did that? Oh, okay. They should yeah. check. And I then mean, also, literally. I believe, Fairfield Prep also had their open house that night. That has nothing to do with Fairfield Public Schools either. Well, who is checking this with the other town bot? No, because I'm telling you, it took, every parent was late. And, uh, and Right, and obviously nobody wanted to get in trouble with their homeroom teacher. So it was... It, um, any other comments for the superintendent? Questions? Seeing none, on to committee liaison reports. Any board member wishes to report on a committee? Ms. Pitko? I believe I mentioned this at the last meeting, but tomorrow night at 7.30 at McKinley is a SEPTA meeting, the first one of the year, and Mr. Mancusi is going to come and introduce himself to the parents and get to know them. Mr. Asa, did I see your hand go up and then followed by Mrs. Maxson Canelli? Yeah, just regarding Holland Hill, um, the last meeting they, you know, was nothing very eventful. Uh, it was approving invoices. And for anyone interested or that was planning to go this week, um, the meeting on Thursday, the regularly scheduled meeting, has been canceled due to lack of uh, um, anything substantive. Uh, any questions for Mr. Asa? This is Max and Canelli. Um, just regarding PTA Council, um, they've only ha they had an executive session, uh, executive leadership meeting uh, in September. Or we look forward to the first meeting in October. And also, uh, just a note to the public that uh, PTA Council will be um, hosting a forum for uh, candidates for Board of Ed on November 1st. And so that's something that uh, PTA Council will be looking to um, drum up publicity for. Any questions for Mrs. Max and Canelli? Hearing none, Mrs. Gerber. Um, just an update with uh, Fairfield Ludlow. Um, the uh, committee approved a bunch of invoices from all of the windows that were installed over the summer. And uh, Mark Donald, who is the building committee chair, will be going to the Board of Selectmen to give them an update. But really, it's just an update to say everything went as well as it possibly could have in the first summer. And fingers crossed it will continue to do so next summer. What, what percentage of the windows roughly has been replaced? Approximately 70%. As I said last time, the reason why it was so lopsided is because they did all of the easier windows this summer and the more complicated ones that require masonry and a more difficult uh, extraction are going to be next summer. So it'll still take all summer, um, but it, uh, you know, but a, a lot of them. And they look great actually having been at Open House, I will say. You could really tell the difference between the new windows and the old windows. So, okay. Any other committee or liaison reports? Any other committee or liaison reports? Having none, open board comment. Anybody wish to make any comments at this time? Any open board comment? <laughs> Mr. Asa, did you have a comment that you wanted? <laughs> oh, I will let Mrs. Maxson Canelli <laughs> handle that. <laughs> Mrs. Maxson Canelli. Well, to heck with you. But I have I have to do my annual plug. Um, I just want to say very excited to be uh, talking about Odyssey of the Mind at several of our PTAs. Um, I'll be speaking with North Stratfield Jennings. I've had contact from Tomlinson Stratfield, and I also reached out to Sherman, and I'm sure McKinley is well underway as well. Um, and just this is my chance with a microphone in front of me to remind PTAs that I would love to help anybody who's interested in getting uh, this program started. Um, Open uh, uh, for me, uh, yes, uh, October 10th meeting, we will be putting on the agenda uh, for the board to uh, suggest any budget concepts or ideas that they would like the superintendent to consider when fashioning the 1819 budget. So please come uh, prepared with any ideas that you want to put on the table. Um, we don't do it by vote. We just simply say we take all ideas and then uh, and then the superintendent looks to see what uh, she can and cannot fit into a budget for next year. So please be ready for that particular agenda item on the 10th. In November, I remind the board and perhaps people in the community who may be interested in serving on the Board of Ed that uh, November 16 through 18 is the annual CABE conference. Um, we have reserved uh, spots for the candidates 
um, uh, and then we'll wait until the election is over to determine one, who won, and two, whether they can fit uh, that conference, which we all highly recommend, into their schedule. So you might want to put for the board members the 16 through 18 uh, period on your calendar. Uh, November 15th, we'll be holding the bylaws required orientation session for new board members. So people who might uh, be in that position should, um, should put that date on their calendar. Uh, remind you that the uh, next meeting, and the only meeting in November is the 28th, which is both a regular meeting and an organizational meeting. And board members that may wish to bring forth any bylaw changes, um, the, the idea is that you present the idea at that meeting, and then we fashion the you fashion the language you want to change, and we vote at the December meeting. And of course, the December meeting is December 10th. Uh, any other comments that people wish to make? Wish to make at the board table? If none, to public comment we go. Uh, any member of the public wish to come forward to speak on an agenda item? Now that you've heard discussion and whatnot, please come forward and state your name and address. Hello, my name is Sally Connolly, 682 Tunxis Hill Road. And yes to Jennifer, our McKinley Odyssey of the Mind is getting up and running with Suzanne Graceffa. I, I will also just do an additional McKinley World Fair plug again for November 4th from 1030 to 230. I do have one question in regard to one of the committee reports about the preschools. Um, at some point I had written a letter um, addressed to a few members and spoke about it with Dr. Jones just uh, asking a question about how the filtration was happening um, once the applications were put into the preschools. Um, uh, my kids went to ECC and then when the uh, McKinley was an on-site preschool and when the change was made to the preschool uh, application process basically all the applications were put into one pool and I'm curious um, uh, whoever is assigning the different locations for the students if um, they have taken into consideration the ELL students going to the off-sites versus being some of the typical peers for uh, the ECC um, students because at the time when my kids were there they actually had kind of a basically like an audition proce process to see who would be the best matches for some of the kids in the program. So that was something I was curious to see how that was being addressed and if it was effective in moving some of the ELL kids who maybe would have moved into the McKinley district, um, filtering some kids to the uh, Burr and Stratfield locations. Thank you. Uh, for members of the public who may not be aware, we take public comment but do not, in, at a regular meeting, engage in back and forth conversation on that issue. Uh, however, at town hall meetings that we hold three times a year, that's the time where we are, have an opportunity to have dialogue back and forth. Anybody else wish to come forward, please state your name and address on a subject that you've not already talked about. Okay, I promise. Suzanne Muska, 123 Rygate Road. I, I know that um, the absence policy is pretty much state mandated as they've dictated the number of excused absences you can have. <laughs> um, I just wish that there was some way that um, the Board of Ed policy could uh, make some sort of adjustment to it only because <laughs> as a mother who spent their last year trying to balance college visits um, and when your child actually gets sick, um, I'm going to tell you that nine excused absences gets a little dicey um, once we get to accepted students day. I mean, while we try to do as much as you can on a day that is not a school day, um, it would be helpful to be able to have some sort of caveat that allows for college visits to be outside of the scope of, of um, being looked at. I mean, you, you kind of get, get to March and if your kids had a cold or the flu or whatever, that nine creeps on, on you pretty quickly um, and there's really no, nothing you can do to manage it going forward. So I wish there was some way that policy could give a little more latitude, especially in that year when you're trying to accom accomplish that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else from the public wish to come forward? 
Uh, seeing none, um, the recommended motion for adjournment is that this regular meeting of the Board of Education adjourn. Mrs. Gerber, Mr. Patton seconds. All in favor, please raise your hand. It's unanimous. Thank you very much.